All right, now we're recording, and then I'll just I'll just edit it out. <laughs> this part. That's fine. Hey, everybody! Welcome to the Elseworlds Exchange. I am Sal. I'm Cape Joel. That's right. Cape Joel is here to talk to us about uh, the top, most underrated superheroes of all time, or at least as far as we're concerned. I think. I, I think I pitched this idea to you because it's a turn of phrase you use that I love so much, the unsellables. And I'm like, oh, we should do a whole show on unsellable. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. Okay. Because, like, the way – that's how I've been describing the Avengers from, you know, their – I think their 80s roots all the way up to the 90s. And yeah. then uh, Bendis was like, hey, how come these guys can't sell? And it's like, because Cersei's on the team. <laughs> like <laughs> because Which, vision is boring and then they're like oh well then why don't we just put spider-man wolverine and like a couple of the main guys on the team you know the people that are always synonymous with the avengers but then as it turns out like they're rarely on the team you know thor captain america and iron man all mm -hmm. at the same time although thor, a, thor's dead during that period it's it's so funny you know you're you're saying you know that's the state of Marvel. I like if you go on over to like the Justice League. Oh my they God. have had many similar similar histories of having just like who cares on the team. Oh yeah. Oh boy, fire and ice. I mean like I'm glad they're always th the first ones. Fire and ice. They are always fire first. and ice. I mean like look, do is their dichotomy? Is their relationship fun? Fine. I grant you that, especially in a book like Justice League International where it makes sense to explore those relationships, but then to bring them over to the JLA proper and to put them next to, like, Guy Gardner and Maxima and Booster Gold and Bloodwind, you're like, what the hell are you trying to do? Bury the brand? Not a great team. Not a great lineup. Hell, I would even argue, like, Justice League Detroit had a better lineup. Well, it had a very similar Justice lineup. <laughs> it had exactly. Martian Manhunter, who was Bloodwind, and it had Fire and Ice, and I think uh, Guy Vibe. Gardner was a, re was a Green Lantern at the time. Don't forget Vibe and Gypsy, who are actually doing quite well on TV, hilariously. That is bizarre. They, they On TV right now, they basically have the entire makeup for Justice League Detroit if they ever want to do it. And Legends of Tomorrow even paid homage to the warehouse years. Wow, that's nice. I, I know, right? It's just all coming together, I yeah. tell you. Well, uh, so yeah, I, I think that the way I built it was the Avengers used to be a team of characters that couldn't sell a damn book to save their lives. So let's explore that. Let's talk about some of those characters that just couldn't sell a book to save their lives. Scarlet Witch is one of those characters. Yeah. Who sell? Who is currently? I think is the book canceled yet, or is it still going? I don't know. I I, I I've never been a fan of Scarlet That's Witch. That's the so thing. I yeah. I don't care about Wanda Maximoff's struggle. I like her in stuff. She's one of those characters where it's like, oh hey, Scarlet Witch showed up. This should be interesting. But I don't care about her enough to follow her own solo adventures. Exactly. Like what solo adventures is my question. I mean. <laughs> The she, most I liked her was in Vision just recently when they doubled down on her relationship with the Vision. Absolutely. No, I mean, and again, supporting character. She is a uh, just one patch in the quilt of the Vision's life. Like, that's my ex-wife with whom I had magic children. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no. Uh, Scarlet Witch is, like, for me, a staple of, like, the who gives a shit Avengers. Even though Scarlet Witch is a very interesting character supposedly uh not interesting incredibly powerful incredibly powerful uh she's really for me more of a plot device and that's mm -hmm. that's a problem when you have a character who like <laughs> for me it's like you look at scarlet witch who's like come kind of always been an avenger ever since like the second roster of the avengers yep. and she's always just kind of been a member of the team even through the awful 90s cartoon series avengers assemble i think is the oh, name of the show yeah. i don't remember uh, but it was it was the worst show ever don't even waste your time but she, she has the worst moose and squirrel voice she does well because they're like i don't know where she's from i don't know what what accent that is give her one of those russian ones <laughs> and uh but Go even through it. that scarlet witch has always been there and then like all the way up until avengers disassembled they were like hey who's always been there like hey who needs to leave and like scarlet witch is just like me I like guess. just just crouched behind some larger character like the beast uh, you know, my favorite thing about that Avengers Assembled cartoon is, and I'm sure I've mentioned this before, in their hideout, they have, like, actual real comic book artwork up on the wall. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure somewhere there's a portrait of Magneto, 
And I'm like, oh, that mu- that must have been an awkward conversation when, you know, when she was like, no, 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 let's put up this picture of my dad. And everyone else is like, you know, he's like a mutant terrorist. Yeah, yeah the, he's my dad, though. Let's put up this right. painting of him. The genocidal madman. Yeah, let's put him up there. Um, actually, I was wrong about the name of the show. It was Avengers United They Stand. Which right, is worse. So assembled is the new one. As, which is, by the way, upkeeping the noble tradition of terrible Avengers cartoons. Avengers mm-hmm. Assembled and Avengers United Did They Stand. Um, let's see. Hawkeye is another character that was like a character that had for the longest time proven he can't sell a book until Matt Fraction came along. <laughs> yes, and he made one a hell of a book that took the character back to basics, made him human, was not afraid to make him schlubby. And even right now, Hawkeye is heading up his own Avengers team in uh, Occupy Avengers, who is like, you know, we're going to change our mission statement completely. No more cosmic bullshit. No more fighting with each other. I'm going to fight for the little guy. I'm going to deal with this Keystone Pipeline thing. I'm going <laughs> to deal with all this other stuff. That's what I'm going to do. Come on, Red Wolf, who is another unsellable yeah, in his own poor right. Red Wolf. I will say, um, with respect to Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch and any of these unsellable characters... You know, they are on these teams, and they're all these characters who just, for whatever reason, couldn't sell a damn book. Dark Hawk, for example. Um, yes. But uh, but these characters, all probably in today's climate, if they were given a miniseries, could just knock it. Like, every one of these characters we've mentioned so far, with the notable exception of Dark Hawk, is <laughs> a character who had been disregarded for so many years, and then suddenly some cracking writer came along and said, like, no, I'm going to do something cool with them. And critically knocked it out of the park. Even mm-hmm. the current Scarlet Witch book, which I don't give a crap about. I love those covers, but I just can't be bothered oh, yeah. to read a Scarlet Witch book. Um, it's just not engaging enough of a character for me. Uh, but that's, uh, that's why I think right now DC actually has the right idea because yeah. they've given quite a few unsellables, actually, miniseries. Here's a three-part Dead Man. Here's a five-part Captain Adam. Oh, yeah. Well, but even Marvel did that with Scarlet Witch. Has a, had, a, had a decently well-received series, Hawkeye, Moon Knight. Yes. All these characters who are disregarded. I'm still waiting for that Sleepwalker series. That's my back pocket Marvel pitch. Is, be it, a, is that your one? I think will be my... I'm, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that, Sal, because that's another thing about these quote-unquote unsellable characters. I'm sure somewhere out there there's a young up-and-coming writer who's got a dynamite pitch for one of these. It's true. Well, as long as you know how to tell a story, then you have a killer pitch for one of these characters. Like, mm-hmm. ooh, how about Tigra? Tigra's a character who can't sell a damn book, and yet oh. she's a living furry. How could you not make an amazing book about that? I mean, Dude, have you have you seen the internet? Have you seen Deviant Art? Yeah, I mean, look at uh, Patsy Walker Hellcat. That became a series, and they, they just did. embraced the kind of trashy romance, you know, uh, serial aspect of the character, and and went, you know what? She hasn't been selling a book because she she's just kind of an interchangeable superhero. But if we if we embrace her roots and play with this whole aspect of her actual character, we might be able to get a series out of this. And indeed, they do. Keep it, keeping on that run, too, how come no one has been able to do anything with Son of Satan, Damien Hellstorm, a character who predates Hellboy and Spawn and a bunch of these other characters? I, it's true. I mean, it's it's funny, though. He he would make random appearances in uh, Bendis' Avengers run, and you could tell, like, Bendis really liked that guy. Just really <laughs> wanted to put him somewhere, and there just wasn't a place for him. But yeah, Damien Hellstrom, no. <laughs> You, you know where he was great just recently, where he had an amazing cameo, where they even mention his rich history? Uh, Power Man and Iron Fist. They wow! Big, yeah, they had a Christmas annual where, like, a demon, it was it was the Krampus, was trying to corrupt children with, like, these evil Tamagotchi dolls. Mm-hmm. And so Damien Hellstrom comes to help the heroes for hire fight him, and they're like, wait, 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 son of Satan, are you a good guy or a bad guy now? We can never keep track. Right. <laughs> And he's like, no, no, I'm a good guy this week, I think. I'm also I'm also a lord of hell. I don't know. Yeah. I'm complicated. Yeah, despite my past and name, uh, I'm a good guy. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes he's not, though. That's the thing. Depending on who's writing him, sometimes he's a good guy, sometimes he's a bad guy. Uh, that's frustrating. That's another reason why they don't sell, by the way. I think it's be- not just be- it's not because the characters suck, although some of them just straight up do. Yeah. Uh, Wonder Man, for example. <laughs> One, yeah, wow, Wonder Man. Plus, he's got the name. Like, you hear, like, Wonder Man. Is he connected to Wonder Woman? No, actually, not in the slightest. Totally fact. different universe. Totally different publishing company. Just weird. Um, but uh, I'll get back to Wonder Man. But 
The fact is, the characters... I think they could do a really good, like, BoJack Horseman Hollywood take on Wonder Man, they I think. They did. They did a, a Hollywood Wonder Man book. It was his series, Wonder Man from the 90s, which I picked up the first issue of when I was young. And I was kind of interested. I kind of dug it. That was the pitch they went with. Yeah, it was... Wonder Man says, screw the Avengers, I'm going I'm going to Hollywood. Like, I'm going back <laughs> to my roots, and he does. And he becomes, like, L.A.'s superhero slash actor. It'd be like if Brad Pitt in 1997 became a superhero. How did that not take? That's a great pick. I don't know. It was a miniseries, and, I mean, like, the fact is, it was still mired in 90s comic book telling, but mm-hmm. it very much tried to be its own thing in its own p- corner of the Marvel Universe. It just, I don't think it resonated with people. Maybe it was, bef- maybe it was ahead of its time. I guess, yeah. Like, if it came out now post-Bojack Horseman and all these other big, like, Hollywood revivals. Oh, like, yeah. imagine that Wonder Man where he's like, yeah, I used to be big once upon a time, but, you know, retro nostalgia is in, so, you know, my movies are getting played a bunch more now. Yeah. And people want to see more of me. I mean, just just in the world where the Marvel Cinematic Universe is crushing it, having a Wonder Man series where he lives in the Marvel Universe and people love Marvel movies is a, is a pitch. It's, look... It's not a pitch in as much as it's a solid block of ice, but if a talented person takes a chainsaw to it, you can get an ice sculpture of a pitch out of that block. I Imagine think. how meta a Wonder Man movie would be within the confines of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where he's just an actor, and they're like, yeah, with all these real-world superheroes, we really want to start making movies about them. Yeah, well, and, and maybe have him be a disbeliever, like, nah, man, superhero movies will never take off. Well, did you see the behind-the-scenes photos of like the Simon Williams Film Festival from Guardians of the Galaxy 2? Oh, yeah, 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 and there was posters, wasn't There's there? There's those posters, and one of them is Simon Williams as Tony Stark in the Tony Stark story. Oh, so there you go. So they're basically already running. They're right. already doing it, and you know that shot's going to be like one shot, not even like referenced. I think Nathan Fillion is standing in for Wonder Man, by the way. Which would be amazing casting. Oh, yeah, that's no question. Stand back, people. I'm just Captain Hammer, but I'm in the Marvel Universe now. Are you, are you afraid of making money? Because the only reason you're not making that into a thing is because you're afraid of money. Yeah, yeah, no. And there's rumblings that Firefly might be getting another revival, so... I heard that. The fact is, every time like Firefly is anywhere close to coming back to life, Nathan Fillion gets a job, so <laughs> let's, uh, let's hope that works out. Yeah, I meant to ask you this, Sal, because you're probably the biggest Firefly fan I know. Do you care? Do no. you care? No, neither do I. No, it's over. Uh, first it is. of all, I was a casual fan, even I don't care anymore. I loved that series like, you know, like I loved Star Wars before it hurt me. And <laughs> But, like, here's the thing. Firefly was a great uh, replacement for Star Wars, but then Star Wars got good again. It is, and we got Guardians of the Galaxy in the meantime too, which is also a really awesome space opera. And it's and it's a great substitute in 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 its own right. But that said, it doesn't diminish Firefly or make it like less great. The show is still awesome and still holds up. It's still a solid series with great like beautiful characters and some fun great music and shit. But uh, but no, it's over. Ron Glass has passed. They killed mm. off Wash in the movie. There's no point in bringing us back, especially because I think that the the, the caveat for bringing uh, Firefly back is Joss Whedon has to come back, which That's true. like if anyone would want that, except for the fact that when Joss Whedon has sole control over Firefly, you get a really miserable psychodrama about like wretched people who hate everything, and mm. I don't like. I want Tim Minear the co-creator or co-writer of Firefly to have sole control over it because every episode that Tim Minear wrote is great. And every episode that Joss wrote is Whedon-esque. Like, Whedon, like, pretty much solely wrote the first and last episodes of that series. And those are the most, like, God damn it, Joss Whedon episodes of the series. Like, no, if they said Ben Edlund and Tim Minear are going to take over Firefly, I'd be like, the first in line. And plus, too, I mean, you know, most of those actors are busy with other projects now, except for, like, uh, Adam Baldwin, but, you know. No, I mean, you could get them all back. I mean, look, like, I think Powerless will be canceled shortly. Yeah, Uh, probably will. Actually, it's funny. We mentioned Fire. Fire's going to show up in uh, Powerless. She's going to be the resident hero, apparently. Good, that's fine. I mean, like, you should use these forgotten or unsellable characters in any place that you can fit them. Because the point I was making about Wonder Man is these characters are not crappy. No. It's just that they are given to either people who don't care 
or lesser creators. If you have somebody who like cares enough about the character or cares enough to tell a decent story, then these characters can the, the cream rises. These characters are all all have potential. I mean Indeed. like Look at the Wasp. Wasp is a character that was constantly disregarded. And mm -hmm. yet, I love Janet Van Dyne as a character. I am I especially Same. loved her. My favorite version of her is Earth's Mightiest Heroes, the Avengers cartoon show. Ooh, that's Since we really reference all the Avengers cartoon shows, let's reference the best one, because she's our ride-along character. She's our she she's the eyes through which we can view the, the Avengers. The POV. Which is great, because she's the smallest. You know what I mean? Like, it's... There's great uh, metaphorical reasons for her being the ride-along character, but also that characterization of Janet really works, and it's fun. Oh, yeah. And while she's been kind of difficult to get into the head of in the comics, I was sad that she got shortchanged very shortly after she was finally, like, resurrected after her demise in Secret Invasion, when yeah. she was, like, she when she got big and exploded, but then it turns out she just got really, really small really, really fast and, like, got stuck in the microverse. And now we got a new wasp, but it's not her. That's but, you know, the thing. I think I think she's involved. Like I think she's like the surrogate mother to the new Natasha Pym or Nadia Pym. That's weird too, because it's like no, the wife of your dad is gonna help you become the wasp. Like, f ah. it's weird. It's like shouldn't you shouldn't you become the new Ant Man or new Ant Woman at that point? Ah, but we had that really good uh, Scott Lang series, and Scott Lang's in the movie. That's the other, that's another character. Ant Man is a very like unsellable character until he wasn't. Yeah, I fucking love that last Nick Spencer run. That was magical. That's one of the best runs for an unsellable character. Easily, I mean Nick Spencer, man, the dude is lightning in a bottle most and of the time. And fucking funny, like he made Scott Lang so funny. Nick Spencer, it's funny that he's doing. You know, he's become so huge now for his high mind political intrigue and drawing from the headlines and yeah. everything. What I think he excels at better than anyone else is comedy and finding, you know, the heart of real schlubby yeah. characters. Well, Superior Foes of Spider-Man is, like, the litmus test for that. Like, just, Amazing. bam. Perfect example. But, uh, but yeah, these are just Avengers. I mean, like, look, let's look at, let's look at some DC corners. Here's a character that's unsellable but doesn't get any love. Uh, the Question. Oh, yeah, and it's so weird, too, because it's like, man, this guy has an interesting costume, an interesting look, an interesting history in publications. Why can't you do anything with him? Both versions, in fact, the Vic Sage version and the Rene Montoya version. Yeah, I loved either one. I mean, like, and what's funny is I never really regarded uh, the question until he got his due in the Justice League cartoon show. Friggin' Combs, man, doing his voice. So great just nailed it i was like you know that, that little guy. plastic thing on the edge of your shoes right there the <laughs> the, the real meaning anklets is or whatever yeah anklets, yeah, anklets that's anklets. it oh, that was amazing come on supergirl i go through everyone's garbage <laughs> um but i feel bad because he's also he's the template for rorschach ladies and gentlemen like absolutely if you love rorschach you probably love the question because the question is less of a fascist yes <laughs> L less of a nut and a lot less hateful. Yeah. Um, another guy who can't sell a book for, for crap despite everyone's obvious love for him, Martian Manhunter. I'm so glad you brought this up. I've had so many fans asking me when that new JLA book came out. They're like, why isn't Martian Manhunter on any team? Why isn't Martian Manhunter anywhere? He has a sizable fan base. The only problem is, is that they can never make a book with him last for more than like a volume or so. It's just, I mean, and I, that's Martian. John is a difficult character, a difficult nut He's to crack. He's too weird. He's too powerful. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do a story about an orphan alien who has superpowers and the, the DC universe, just do a Superman book. Like it's, I feel bad. Cause I think that there's potential for John. I loved him in the cartoon. He was excellent, but he was a supporting character. But he's a supporting character. Um, I don't think that there is a pitch good enough to save Martian Manhunter for more than 12 or, it's like 12 or 20 issues. I have a pitch. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> Why not? I, Let's do it. <laughs> I've been working on this one for a bit. Okay, so in my Martian Manhunter story, what, what, what year was he created? 1960, 19 I assume whatever. it's in the 60s, but I'll take a look. He's, he, he's old, but he's not that old. 
So I keep the original origin intact. He comes to Earth through the telescope, meets the Doctor. Very yeah, b- b- very uh, Darwin Cook. Like I keep all that. shit. Oh yeah, intact. all the all the new frontier shit. Yeah, yeah, all the new frontier shit that happened. That's fifty-five, when Martian by Manhunter. the way, he was invented in fifty-five. Fifty-five. Okay, so Martian Manhunter John Jones came to Earth in fifty-five. Yeah, but he was also followed by a bunch of terrifying shape-shifting white Martians. Yes, and because of that, John goes around for the next like decades like decades and decades you go full highlander with it where he's running around as detective john jones hunting down white martians who are trying to invade the planet earth and getting into situations of power and everything okay. and you know, he's the only one who can defeat them and you do you do it like a period piece every issue you jump to a different period in time and this is before he's even a superhero this is him you know running around doing cool alien they live shit and i know what people are saying wasn't that kind of the pitch for the last Martian Manhunter book, only it was the Green Martians doing it, not the White Martians. Uh-huh. He was like a sleeper agent and everything. My, my version's better because it's Martian Manhunter <laughs> by way of Highlander. Yeah, that is basically Highlander. I'd buy that. I would get the first couple of issues of that, or at least, just to check it out. That sounds but good. But the problem... The problem with that is, like you said, that's only a 12-issue issue pitch, where it's like, well, what happens when he gets to modern day and he's killed all the White Martians? Then, uh. Well, like, or he doesn't. You know, like... Well, he meets one white Martian who turns out to be Magan Maors, the uh, the Miss Martian. Oh, okay, there you go. And then he's like, well, maybe I'm the asshole then. Maybe if this one white Martian can be redeemed, maybe they're not all so evil. And maybe he lies to her about what he did to the white Martian, so that causes, like, a whole thing between them. Well, maybe it's like, uh, what's it called? He, um, it's like I Am Legend. Mm. Where it's like, oh my god, I've been killing all these Martians. I was the monster all along. I yeah. Didn't know. You, you mean the good ending for I Am Legend, not the well, bad there's, one. They yeah, there's also a comic series that that works for it as well, and and a book. So yeah, oh, but it? but basically, yeah, just just uh, just I Am Legend, but with Martian Manhunter. There you go. By the way, that's your yeah. elevator pitch. Just it's I Am Legend, but with Martian Manhunter, and they're like, Man. whoa, tell me more. That would be a good one too. Like the world is destroyed, and John is the last one alive on Earth. Okay, that's a sweet uh, that's a sweet Elseworlds book that I would buy. It is because they would never do that in the main universe. That's a totally weird Elseworlds story. Yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but yeah, that's that, that's my elevator pitch for Martian. It's not Man. bad, it's actually. Bad it's not bad. I mean, like, poor Jean, man. The dude is never gonna get his due. I don't think. And not even a dress now in DC Rebirth. It's like, hey, where's Martian Manhunter? Who cares where Who Martian Manhunter? Who cares? Manhunter is? I mean, like, and you know what? I agree. <laughs> Like I feel like, bad. I should be. I should be as a as voices in the comic book world and as fans of comic books ourselves. We should care about the preservation of all characters. We really should. I really don't give a crap about John. You know what John needs? John needs a vision treatment. Is what he needs. Yeah. He needs twelve solid issues. Heck, you could even do the same thing because John's always torn up about the loss of his alien family and everything. Let him find a new family out there somewhere, and let's actually see Martian Manhunter as a dad trying to build a life for himself, and let's see how that goes for him. Right? That's not a bad idea. Hey, in the same vein of DC characters that can't seem to sell a book for crap, how about Shazam? <laughs> oh, God, yes. Again, Shazam, hugely vocal ba- fan base. Yes. Although, although that fan base is kind of not enough. in the middle. Because some people are like, oh, well, he was always Captain Marvel to me. Yeah, I look, I agree that I hate the name change. But Shazam is the wizard we know. Shaz- yeah, because Shazam's the wizard, and like the and the word he has to say to transform, he can't refer to himself. Like it's it's complicated. That said, um, wh- I don't care about Shazam mostly because I'm not a huge magic fan. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I don't like once you get, once you get into like all when every time I see Shazam, with the notable exception of Kingdom Come, because right. he's a plot device. Yes, he is. And that's Mark Wade's like, brilliance, you know? Look, I'm making Shazam cool, while also not actually doing anything with him. Uh, but with Shazam, or Captain Marvel, however you want to call him, every time I think of him, or I see him do anything, I see his origin. I see him in a cave with a wizard, and him mm-hmm. saying, Shazam! And the S-H-A-Z-A-M, like, spelling out, like it being an anagram for what the fuck all the other words strength of hercules achilles blah, 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 yeah like yeah. Sh- get a fuck that like can you can you please just throw all that away 
it's it's true. You know, he's one of those heroes that whenever we see him, they're just retelling his origin again. Jeff Johns tried in the beginning of the new Fifty Two with a bunch of backups. Yeah, he got backups. He didn't even get his own. No, book. he's like, no, no, no. We're gonna make him a tough, fast talking street kid. He's not the oh shucks, G Willikers, right? You know, Billy Batson, boy kid that he was. Even though it's like, well, that kind of informs a lot of what he is. Right, but that is that who away. he is. Yeah. <laughs> you know what the best Shazam story was, and ironically, they called him Captain Marvel in it. In Multiversity, we got a story from the Fawcett universe, which is just Grant Morrison writing old Captain Marvel stories like Time Never Changed. Oh, okay. That's the best one, where it's like, and this is the Fawcett universe, here's Mary Marvel and all the other Marvels, they live on their own in this universe, unmolested by the passage of time. That's really where they be- I, I think the best way to make Shazam work is actually what the DCEU was planning on doing with them in the first place. Where they're like, we're going to make a Shazam movie. He's over there. There's no connection because it's weird and it doesn't fit. You know what would have been perfect too? And this has always been the problem with Shazam. In fact, there was a big legal case over how much he resembles Superman. Oh yeah, well that's how he's. That's how they have him. That's how they got him, through legal means. He didn't start as a, uh, what is it, as a DC character. They no. got him through legal finagling. I always thought... If they wanted to do, like, another Earth 2 style thing where it's like, look, all the heroes you know and love are gone. No Wonder Woman, no Batman, no Superman. Right. I could see Shazam fill the void of a Superman didn't in a world that? that didn't have... Didn't they do that they, in 52? They did, and I think they did it in Future's End. God so. damn it! I know, so they've actually tried that idea a couple times. It didn't work either time. Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah. I will it's say, a good pitch, it just, it just it was never executed well. Right, I mean, well, 52, I think it was better. But Well, in that, any case. That was the best version of it, which is why people are in love with it yeah. so much. Uh, I also liked Shazam! The Monster Society of Evil, which was like a very separate uh, kind of... Very, very fun, very kid-friendly. Yeah, and of course made by Jeff Smith, who did Bone. So if you ever like want to get into Shazam! and you're not sure where to start, just grab that, because it's just a fun... I think it exemplifies the best qualities of the character without it like it without it being complicated by having him be in the DC universe. But yeah, Shazam is not a sellable character to the point where like where is he now? Again, he's another he showed up in the first couple issues of Constantine then gone. Good. It's it's <laughs> it, it's interesting too, you know, we say that a lot of these unsellable characters work excellently as supporting characters. Yeah. I love the version of Shazam they did for the Justice League cartoon as we mentioned. Oh yeah, he was great. But, where he's the wide-eyed little kid who gets to hang out with the adults and in the end actually kind of tells them what they need to hear about saying, no, you've gotten too dark, too cruel, too angry, and too mistrusting. That's right. No, that was, was an a, excellent speech. That was a killer episode. That was uh, and, Jerry O'Connell played him? Yes, yeah, and, a, and a speech totally ahead of its time. too. And Young Justice, yeah. he's really good in that too. Oh, nice. Where it's, where it's like, okay, Shazam, you be the den father now for all these young teens even though he's technically a little younger than the teens and he wants to be cool and hang out with them. <laughs> oh, but no! They just, but they just think he's a weird adult. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, <It's>... what... <laughs> Did you see the SNL sketch, uh, uh, like, the drama cast party? Yes, yes, I did. It's, like, the lyric where it's, like, it's kind of weird that the teacher showed up. <laughs> yeah, kinda... yeah, I did see that. Oh, it was for the uh, the Crucible, wasn't it? The Crucible cast party, thank you, that's it. Yeah. That was uh, that was the guy from uh, Hamilton. He hosted that night. Yes, that was great. I, I I am always up to date on my Saturday Night Live. I watch it all the time. I'm probably the only person my age who does watch it all the time. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's enjoying a, a significant renaissance right now. Now it is, but I was watching even before. That's fair. Um, another unsellable DC character who I another character. This is three in a row of characters I don't give a fuck about, but look pretty rad, and I can't. I can't separate them from my, like, pantheon image of DC characters. Dr. Fate. Dr. Fate looks amazing. He has been in cool stories, but again, I think you're hitting on a much bigger problem here. DC can't sell their magic universe with a fuck. Fo- That's with, really uh, what it is. Fo- yeah, and, and it's funny because I think DC has more rules associated with magic than Marvel does. They do. They do. They really do. I mean, like, uh, Jason Aaron is kind of setting up some rules laying some groundwork, but the fact is, what I know in my heart of hearts, with DC, if, like, Jeff Johns says, this is how magic is in the DC Universe, that's how it will be. If Jason Aaron sets up how magic is in Marvel, eh, fuck it. 
is how Marvel will approach it. Like, Pretty if much. I want to do something else, though, then I'm going to do that. And I'm not going to pay attention to it. Like, here's the thing. Uh, you know, I may be the editor-in-chief, but I didn't read Doctor Strange by Nick by, by Jason Aaron. So yeah. I don't really know what's going on. You know, like, you know that's the approach. So it's frustrating to have, like, rules lay down and then have them be completely disregarded or know they're going to be disregarded mm. at their most crucial point by the editorial. DC Doctor at least cares. Yeah, it's true. You know, Dr. Fate is one of those characters, too, where it's like, okay, Dr. Fate, you know his look, you know his powers, you know he's basically the Sorcerer Supreme of the DC Universe. Whenever Superman has a magic problem, he goes to him. Yep. But what can you tell me about the dude under the helmet? What can you tell me about Kent Nelson or any of the other guys who have had the helmet? Uh. Yeah, not much. I mean, like, he has a rad costume, and he seems to have, like, an association with the Ankh image, mm. which, like, what? I don't know. That's that's the weird disconnect. Everyone knows Naboo, the spirit of the helmet. <laughs> no one really knows anyone under the helmet. And Doctor Fate too has undergone like several reinventions oh, of them yeah. trying to do something new. Remember Fate from the nineties? He had a big knife and an onk on his face. How could I forget? They were doing a very similar thing with Doctor Strange, where they turned him into Spawn. It was <laughs> it was a really weird and terrible time for magic in the comic world. Because yeah. magic wasn't hardcore enough. No, I don't give a shit about Doctor Fate. I will never buy a Doctor Fate book. I I don't care, and I don't know why. It's weird because I love his, his I love his design. Still there. Did you drop out? Oh, are you, can you hear me? Uh, now I can. Okay. Well, anyway, man, uh, man we talked too much shit about Doctor Fate, and he ruined our podcast. <laughs> um, hey, another DC character that I don't think gets gets books sold by him or about him is Firestorm. Yeah, and Firestorm is another one of those cases where he's doing amazing on television yeah. right now. Weird. Both in the Legends show, where they've kind of changed him around a little bit because they fucked up with the original part of Firestorm because that uh, guy got another show, so they had to recast him. Yeah. And even in the cartoon uh, Justice League Action, which if you're not watching everyone, you should because it is delightful. Yes. It's fun. They made, him a, <laughs> they made him a class clown in that, which I thought is funny. Okay, I'll take that. He's kind of a goofball where, you know, Firestorm is goofy – but the professor inside his head is always like, now, Raymond, you calm down and you get serious. Uh, that's fun, I guess. <laughs> it's it, it, They have a good back and forth. They have a really funny back and forth. In fact, in uh, the last episode, he had to create some kryptonite because they were fighting General Zod. And basically, the professor had to sit him down and try and teach him the, like, periodic table of kryptonite. He's like, ah, this is easy. I got this. Ah, too much information. It uh, that's fun. <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's literally an alien uh, compound. Jeez, you didn't think that would be so hard, right? would you? Yeah. But he's a cool character. He's, he's, uh, he has potential, but he can't sell a book. It's, it, well, it, he's a hard pitch is what he is because it's like, whoa, 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 wait. He's one hero, but he's two guys who have yeah. to be together all the time. Yeah. Well, why would these two guys ever break up? What, and one's a jock and one's a nerd, but they got to get along? What? Like, that's stupid. So it's the odd couple? Yes, it's uh, the odd couple if they were a superhero. Like, oh, I don't know if I want to read that. <laughs> Canceled. Yeah, <laughs> it's true, yeah. And he's had a couple kicks at the can. Frickin' Gail Simone was writing him yeah. at the beginning of the new 52, and she couldn't make gold out of him. Mm -hmm. so, Gail Simone made me give a shit about Catman, but she couldn't make me give a shit about <laughs> Firestorm. Poor Catman. Um, Catman is so good yeah. when Gail Simone writes him. Yeah. Um, similarly, any of the Hawk people can't sell books. Oh, uh, and they have a rich, interesting history, amazing powers, and a couple good stories like the Ranthanagar War and all that other stuff, but just nothing. Just nothing. Don't sell books. It's uh, so much to the point that Hawkman has to share a book with Adam Strange, another unsellable Oh, story. yeah, no, yeah. Uh, I'm going to rush out and pick up the Adam Strange series. <laughs> and, and I like Adam Strange more now that Jeff Lemire retconned him to be Canadian. Okay. <laughs> Because cause look at his costume. It's red and white. He's a patriot. That's He's wearing true. the colors that's, of the Canadian flag. That's that's clever. That's clever retconning. I admire that. He's a hey, Canadian scientist, eh? You know what else is another character that you that you love that can't seem to sell books for some fucking reason is Jonah Hex. Oh, I was just about to mention, man, it kills me every time that they can't do anything with Jonah Hex. I think 
Because I think we know unequivocally the only person who gives a shit about Jonah Hex anymore is Jimmy Palmiotti and Justin Gray. Yes. Because they've been writing him for the last decade in one form or another. And they've all been excellent. And they've all been these underground hits in their own way. Yeah, it's weird. And it's what's weird to me is that DC doesn't just get Garth Ennis to write the Jonah Hex miniseries that launches his new book. It seems like such a no-brain. Well, I think... Because, you know, I think in the same way, Jonah Hex is the same problem that, like, the Blackhawks or Unknown oh, Soldier yeah. has, where it's like, you, people don't like war comics, people don't like Western comics anymore. Yeah. I people didn't... like superheroes. These were characters that filled voids in and between superheroes. Yeah. I had a pitch, by the way, I don't know if I can, if I can get into it, but I will maybe later, about, uh, for the, for the Blackhawks. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, I know how to sell the Blackhawks, but, like, I don't know if... I don't know if it'll work, so I'll get I, into it. I, I have a Jonah pitch, and I'm amazed Paul Miotti never did this. Like, yeah. I'm legit amazed. I almost sent this to him like, dude, this one's free. I just want to see it happen. Yeah, what is it? So Har- so Harley Quinn, of course, is the flagship book that he, him and his wife are doing right now. It's beloved. She's the new pillar of DC Comics. Good for her. Yep. Harley has all sorts of crazy adventures where she travels through time, meets her bombshells counterpart, you know, does all this other stuff. Yeah. How have they never done a story? And this would have been perfect for Harley's little black book. I don't think that's still going. Is I think that stopped. I think they ended it, yeah. Here was my Harley's little black book pitch. Harley travels back in time to the Wild West, has an adventure with Jonah Hex, and then when she goes home, Hex just follows her, and then he becomes a guy who lives in Harley's apartment complex in Coney. That, I mean, like, have they brought him into the present, really? Yes, like, yes I, they did. I, I, I the figured new- he's been there. Why not? He has. And he was even there before that. He's like, hey, you know, I time travel a lot, actually. I'm totally used to the present. (laughs) There was an amazing bit by the end of All-Star Western where Hex had come to the future, got his face fixed by, like, his stripper girlfriend that he had met. Okay. And then he was driving around with, like, a bunch of... He was rich because he got a bunch of Wild West gold. Oh, my God. That was worth millions now. Traded in his revolvers for Desert Eagles. Oh, that's cool. Went to Gotham, fought the mutant gang... And just had, like, this crazy adventure in the future. Oh, he met Superman, and Palmiotti got to write an amazing Superman, and uh, Jonah's like, I don't like that super feller. I don't trust him. No one's that good. <laughs> Only to actually have Superman give him a talking to him. Like, ah, I guess you're all right then, Superman. That's, that's fine. <laughs> and then, it, it, oh, it was Booster Gold who brought him to the future, actually. Oh, okay. And then Booster Gold's like, oh, shit, man, I gotta bring you back. Yeah, you can't stay here. He's like, no, I figured it out. I'm better now. My life is so much better now. It absolutely was. Then he goes back to the past and like, ah, shit, I'm back here now. Yeah. I'm going to run out of bullets the for these Desert Eagles. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. That That's my pitch. Have him team up with Harley Quinn, have him live in her Coney Island apartment complex, and then you spin that off into a series of just Jonah Hex bumming around New York doing cool cowboy shit. Let me tell you something. They did that with uh, Garth Ennis wrote a series called Hitman, which just sounds a little similar um, in that it's like, a rough and tumble, gun toting son of a bitch in the DC universe who doesn't really have like a place to call home. But that said, it was Garth Ennis, so it was, of course, it was about an Irishman and he's miserable and everyone's an idiot asshole, especially Batman. Like, you know, it's just. A deconstruction of superheroes. Uh, Also, too, it just hit me there that that's basically what they did with the Red Wolf series. They brought him to the future and made him a cop. And and that book failed, and now he's on the Occupy Avengers with Hawkeye. And I think, who's who's the Batman stand-in for the Squadron Supreme? Oh, uh, is that Nighthawk? Nightbird, Night... Something Bird Night. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it it looks like he's going to be joining the team now. So that's a team of three unsellables now. (laughs) Because his book got canceled. He had a book, and then that one got canceled. Yeah. I love, um, there's a moment in Avengers JLA where when the Avengers meet the Justice League, uh, they, the uh, Hawkeye sees them, and he goes like, God, there's something familiar about these guys, and I don't, I can't put my finger on what they're, like, why do they look so familiar? <laughs> and then, like, halfway through the second issue or something, he goes, I know what it is! These guys are a bunch of Squadron Supreme ripoffs! And I'm like, that's funny. That's good. By the way, it is Nighthawk. Uh, <laughs> Nighthawk, thing. Which is confusing in a book where you have Hawkeye, so whenever I'm talking about it, I'm like, yeah, Hawkeye and Nighthawk go well, to the And I think place. there's another Nighthawk that isn't a member of the Squadron Supreme in Marvel. 
Yeah, I think so, too. So, that's confusing, but all right. I hope that guy joined the team, too, just to complete it. Yeah, might as well. Just get all the knights and hawks. Um, In one place. Another, uh, here's a team or a world that doesn't seem to sell books, and it's called the New Gods. Mm, they've been toying that they might do something with the New Gods. Don't. They might bring them back. Yeah. <laughs> Unless your name is the ghost of Jack Kirby, please don't. Yeah, or you know who would do the sh- who would f- who clearly wanted to do New Gods was Grant freaking Morrison. That I'm surprised they never gave that to him. It looked like he really wanted to. And what's hilarious is like when he was developing Final Crisis, he was like, nobody use the New Gods because I've got plans for them. And then like they use them anyway, and like to lesser effect to like why would anyone use the New Gods when Grant Morrison says he wants to use them like. Number one, there's no way that your pitch has any more heart than Grant Morrison's because nobody feels that strongly about the New Gods. It's true. Although it's funny, we mentioned the New Gods. Forager, of all people, is getting a new book now as part of the Young Animal imprint. Bizarre. Very bizarre. But you know what? That's the sort of imprint it is. And if you're going to pick the weirdest New Gods, you can. uh, Forager. Well, you know, they like Forager for some reason. I see Forager everywhere. He was in the uh, the DC event Cosmic Odyssey. He was on the Justice League cartoon shows. He was, wasn't he? And he had a big part there, didn't he? He played a big role. I guess Forager's a thing people like, despite the fact that he looks like like a fever dream scribble that Jack Kirby made while he had the flu. Because he probably was. He was just like, ah, that. And it's like, what's he's, he do? He's a bug man. Yeah, he's a forager. Like, what? <laughs> he's kind of like Ambush Bug, but not really. Yeah. I don't know. There's a character we haven't seen in forever. Oh, Ambush, Ambush Bug? bug? Yeah. Good. Even e- even Batmite got a miniseries. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. The, the did, trick- you, did you notice that there for a bit? DCU, one of their big things. Like, we're going to try and do some comedy books now. Because you got that. You got Bizarro. Bizarro. You got, like, Dog Welder and everything else. They really yeah. tried to do some comedy miniseries. Yeah, it's tough. When you don't it have... Is. You need real funny people to do it. I mean, like, I remember when Brian Posehn was brought in on Deadpool, and I was like, I, this is not funny. And I think Brian Posehn's hilarious. See, I actually liked it when him and Duggan were writing it together. I thought it had a freakazoid feel to it. But then again, you you heard Posehn's voice less, less and less, and then eventually he was off the book. Yeah. He I don't want to do this Duggan. anymore. I love Brian Posehn. He's a funny fucking guy. Me too. But, uh, but yeah. He, he, his arc was just like the dead president's arc, I think. Yeah. That was his big thing. Yeah, exactly. Deadpool fights the dead presidents, which shit, Deadpool's been basically going nonstop from then until now. Yeah, that's true. That's, yeah, that was kind of like his relaunching. Um, hey, you know who can't sell a book for shit? Uh, Deathlock. No, no, he can't. And they tried. They tried super hard. He was hot for a second there after he showed up on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. They made a new Deathlock. They had this whole Manchurian candidate story yep. going on for him that. where he didn't know he was Deathlock. Yeah. No. No one's going to buy that. Didn't take. That was uh, that was Alice Cott who wrote that. Alice Cott doesn't write comics anymore, I don't think. Yeah, I don't understand that. After he was all. Death- he was at every company. He wrote a little Suicide Squad for a minute. He wrote the uh, Winter Soldier. He wrote that Deathlock, and then he just went away. He just went away. <laughs> just faded away. Just faded away. I still follow him on Twitter, and I'm like, why am I following you? Oh yeah, you used to write comics, didn't you? Yeah. Well, unfollow. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm still following. I'm just like, okay, why not? <laughs> Maybe he'll write something again. I don't yeah, know. or say something interesting. Who knows? Yeah. Um, I remember the Legion of Superheroes really don't sell books very well, but I haven't, they haven't really tried to do anything with them in a long time. Although they are uh, teasing their return in a big way. It, in a bunch of places. They they have mon on Supergirl now. Oh, she's in Supergirl? Like with uh, like with the Rebirth book? No, in the TV show he's oh, on that. Oh, 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 I see. He's on that, and I think they're like dropping a bunch of hints and heralding that the Legion might show up there in some point. And you have the thing... In Supergirl now with Emerald Empress and Saturn Girl and everything else. So right. they definitely look to be putting the pieces in place. Yeah. Yeah. I would not be surprised. I mean, like, yeah. As a per- as a young person, I never got into the Legion of Superheroes. I think we talk about it on one of the episodes of Back Issues we did recently where I'm like, oh, yeah, it was Final Night. I'm like, oh, and they were really pushing Legion of Superheroes during this time. And I don't know why, because who gives a fuck? The, the thing about Legion is either you've been a fan for life or you will never become... Like, pe- people don't become late in life Legion of Superheroes fans. <laughs> is the thing like i'm a nerd my head is filled with useless comic information i can tell you the rich storied histories of a lot of these unsellable characters 
I don't know shit about the Legion, and every time I start reading about the Legion of Superheroes, I'm like, this is too nerdy even for me, I quit. Yeah, I just don't care. And then there's, like, the whole... In the 90s, I remember they try, they were they were like con- concerned about. I think there was an issue with the rights for, to Superboy, and so like the only idea that was worth a damn was the idea that they went back in time, grabbed Superman when he was a kid, and like the reason why he is like this pillar of you know belief for everybody is because like he's had hidden years of training by people who idolized him, and like learned how to be a superhero between the cracks of time. So that when he shows up, he like knows everything already. Like Which, that's a neat idea. That and is an idea they continually pay reference to in the animated series. There was a great episode of Superman where they basically do Terminator with Brainiac, and the Legion has to save young Superman. Yeah. They even did a Legion of Superheroes cartoon show. They did with a young Superman leading the charge. Yep, which I didn't watch because I because I. I don't know if you know this. I don't give a shit about the Legion of Superheroes, and I feel bad because like I know there are people who are like. Fuck no! I love these guys, like Bounce cool. Boy and Brainiac Five and Saturn Girl and like Mon El and who gives a fuck? Like I said, if you're a fan of the Legions, you're a fan for life. You got the tattoo and the membership card and everything. You got your ring. You got your Legionnaire ring. Oh, that's right. They have their own piece of jewelry. Don't they, they do. Fucking DC Rebirth number one. The fucking it was there. There, there's the ring. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I mean, like, I guess you take the good, you take the bad, and you know, whatever, the fucking facts of life, but, like... <laughs> you beat me to it. For me, it's, it literally is just, like, I was like, I go, fine. You want to put Saturn Girl in your DC Universe again? Fine. But, like, don't start shoving these unsellable characters that literally I couldn't care to, like, go give two fucks about. It, it seems like they have an arc in mind, though, for yes. Legion of Superheroes. Between the Emerald Empress stuff and there's going to be a big Superman-Supergirl crossover, yes. which apparently will go deeper into that. Yeah, and there, of course, I think Saturn Girl's the one who's in who's who's in an asylum. Yeah, she's so, in Arkham now. So, you know, like, you, that's gonna there's going to be a reckoning there. I hope it's something cool, and it isn't just, like, at the end of the day, oh, gosh, golly, gee whiz, we're from the 31st century, and we're just so plumb excited to save the day like i don't give a crap about you guys and you're still uh, and your silly ass powers <laughs> uh, another guy who you think would get more player at least bigger spots on teams uh metamorpho yeah poor metamorpho i don't care about him either uh because like he's he's like five ideas literally go, all jammed together yeah uh i think there's a character in there somewhere but i've never bothered to explore it deep enough I, I always bought him as, like, DC's Frankenstein, where, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm not a monster, I'm a man Right, with except that they also have a Frankenstein, and he's the exact same thing. Not this, and, not and he's also super cool, because he's Frankenstein and Helsing all together. Right, like, at least there's something, and it's it has roots in, in, in you know, in literature and, and in mythology. Metamorpho is just, like, a bunch of random things together, and, like, he has pathos. See, I chopped up Frankenstein to what I'm chopping up to DC's inability to launch any of their magical characters, because yeah. that's, you know, where he lives. With Metamorpho, he's like, well, you know, you got a hard science base in yeah. here somewhere with him. You could do something with him. Yeah, you could. Uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a problem with a couple of these characters, and I think that, superficially, some of them just look too damn silly. Yeah, yeah. Like, Metamorpho is one of those characters that, forever, every time I would look at all the DC characters... My eyes would glaze over when I came to Metamorpho. I'm like, I don't care about you because you don't look interesting. Mm. I mean, busy. like, it's That's very soon. Going. Yeah, you're too busy. You got a lot going on. You got a lot of, a lot of, yeah, you got a lot of moving parts. I'm not interested in all that. It's it's a lot of look you got there, Metamorpho. You need to redesign. Yeah, but but then if you re- did redesign him, it would never be as good because here's the thing: there has been no good superhero like, new costume design. I would say since uh, Invincible. Mm. Like, a new superhero costume that's as good as any superhero costume that was designed in the first 50 years of comic books. Spider-Gwen? Is it? Like... I, it's a good color scheme. I like the hoodie. But then again, you're really color just building scheme. on what came before in Spider-Man costumes. It's basically just a just a Spider-Man costume with a hoodie on it. Although, to be fair, Ben Riley Scarlet Spider's costume is just a Sp- Spider-Man costume with a hoodie on it. Like, that sucks. Spider Gwen's costume. Now, now why is isn't that joking clone conspiracy? Hey, you know, Gwen, I was wearing a hoodie on my Spider Man costume before it was cool. Yeah. Well, they don't <laughs> even. I don't, I don't think Riley and Gwen even talk. Spider Gwen, that is. Um, 
But, yeah, damn. Well, she's the one helping him out in Clone Conspiracy. No, she's helping Kane out. Ben oh, Riley is right. the bad guy in Clone Conspiracy. Yeah, I, I guess they couldn't really put a joke in there, could they? I mean, there's... It's full of jokes. The series was a joke. <laughs> did uh, Did you read the last one today? I did. Yes, I did. And then I got really disappointed. I'm like, oh, there's no Mega 2? Shit, I thought I was done. Yeah. Well, because there's... Because they clearly just ran out of pages, and they were like, oh, I guess we gotta do a thing. And they, I remember they said, like, no, there's just too much story. And I'm like, no. You didn't tell a satisfying ending. That yeah. sucks. That ending it just, is... It literally cuts off at the end. It was so rushed and so convenient. Like, uh, Spider-Man, I figured out the sequence! What's the sequence that's happening right now? Yes, and I need your brain to help me f implement it! I did. The end! Like Doc Ock had a cool moment, though. I guess. It was so rushed, I didn't even get, like, I'm going through it. I'm like, duh, we're now at Doc Ock, and he's doing something. Like, duh. That... Back, back to unsellable characters yes. in keeping with the magic theme. Etrigan the Demon. Poor Etrigan, yeah, he can't sell a book. Uh, they he was pushed on him. that magical Justice League that was all d and d -ified. That didn't work. Yeah, they pushed him, though. I remember New 52, the Demon was a series. Yeah, they did push him hard. He, it seems, I think one of the problems with him is like, okay, do I gotta write him all in rhymes, though? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and also, Etrigan is cool. No one really thinks Jason Blood is that cool. No. I mean, you could, I could argue, I'd argue you could make Jason Blood cool. The dude is, like, really old, and he's a, and he's, he's not, like, stupid. You know what I mean? There's no, like, dumb roots with some mystical wizard in a cave that, like, has absolutely no grounding in anything. Like, he's an Arthurian character from those times. Like, a an old guy who can summon, who can swatch places a demon is is a neat concept. I just don't know if there's enough mileage for an ongoing series. I'm surprised they haven't put, like, a really good Hulk writer on Etrigan yeah. and kind of run with similar ideas where it's like, oh, I have this monster in me and I can, you know, save the day when I bring him out, but I'm afraid that if I do, I'll never be able to rein him back in. No, that that is, like, you, like, if DC really wanted to push Etrigan, just make him the Hulk of the DC universe. It seems like such a no-brainer, right? Yeah, that'd be really cool. I, I would have, yeah. And have it be like Jason Blood is the good guy. He doesn't know if he should trust Etrigan though. And you know, and like have Etrigan straight up be the anti-hero he always should be. Where it's like you know, oh, do you really want my help? Do you really need it that badly? Oh yeah, exactly. Oh no, that'd be really cool. I mean, you've kind of got a little bit of that exploration with uh, the Sentry, where he's like, no, I can't do anything good, or the Void will come out and fuck everything up. Like, exactly. But you, I think that could be handled better with that with those characters. It would be. And you know, again, like, have, have them battle against each other. Like, have Etrigan be the villain of his own story, essentially. Yeah, I love that idea. No, I... But yeah, that's that's the way to do it. This is where everybody in the comments like, they did that. It was in the New 52 and no one bought it. Ah, uh, yeah, that's unfortunate. I don't know, though. I didn't read it. Because I don't read Etrigan books. It's true. Neither, neither do I. That's, DC uh... Magic. So, okay. Uh, since we're winding down, are there any other, like, characters you desperately need to mention? Or should we just, uh... Or should we cap it? Oh, I feel I feel like there's some I missed. I know there are a few we've missed, but I'm gonna beat myself up if I don't remember. Uh oh, uh, friggin' Static, Static Shock Man. Oh yeah, poor Static. I don't think Static is an unsellable character as much as I think that the complication of the rights for publishing him mm. precluded his ability to succeed. He has such a rabid fan base of people who didn't even read the original Dwayne McDuffie comics, but who just grew up with him on the cartoons. Yeah. The cartoons that did such a better job of implementing him yeah. into the DC universe than the comics ever did, why Virgil is not a titan is, like, beyond me. That's bizarre. Like, if you're not going to sell a static book, at least put him on those like, one of those teams. He's so neat, especially in a day and age where it's like, hey, Marvel is doing a great job right now with these diverse, young, interesting heroes yeah. who really speak to millennials. You have a ready-made superstar in Static. Why the fuck aren't you using him? Well, you have a legacy of a team of teens that fucking has, are superheroes that have been around for 30 years. Why aren't they resonating like they should? Like, it, And why aren't you implementing characters that should be that like relevant what blows me away 
is that, uh, what is it, Spe speaking of unsellable characters, they gave a new Vigilante a miniseries before they gave Static a new miniseries. I'm telling you, I, th I think it, I don't think that they don't want to, I think it's just that they're afraid of, like, some, somebody coming out of the woodwork and suing them, and just, then them going all in on this character and then having to publicly say no we're not going to we're not going to publish this this black teenage superhero anymore because we're just afraid of like dealing with the rights was it wasn't there word going on for a little bit that like a bunch of the people who had worked with Dwayne McDuffie like his number 2 and number 3 man were going to try and relaunch that comic universe I heard that. again yeah we didn't hear anything else about it, did we? Like, I heard they got the rights and the capital and they were going to actually make a big go of it again. That'd be cool. I mean, like, I wait for that, but I don't know if it's... I, don't know I mean, how, I mean Jesus, if we can have the young animal imprint and now Warren Ellis is spearheading the whole, like, authority Oh, the Wildstorm world? Yeah, why, where is the... Uh, just make a Malibu. Or is it Malibu that, that they came from? I think no, it's... Uh, oh, God, it, it was Duffy's company. Why the hell can't I remember Yeah. It? Um, do, do, just do the Duffy verse. That's all you need. Yeah. Milestone. Milestone, thank you. Um, do the yeah. milestone averse. Do yeah, just milestone. Like just make that an imprint. Cause like yeah. I'm sorry, I was thinking of I was thinking of the Malibu that was purchased by Marvel with Prime and And, and the no Men one. in Black. Yeah. <laughs> Which Marvel threatens that every couple of years, like, oh yeah, yeah, we're totally gonna do like a big uh like a big anniversary piece for Malibu. Yeah, no, you're, you're not. Again. Nope, you're never gonna do it. We promise, and then it doesn't happen. Mark my words, it won't happen. <laughs> man, man, Static Shock, I think. Yeah, I poor think character. Static Shock poor Virgil. Go over great. He had a new 52 book. It just, just, they didn't get a great writer for it, I don't that think. That sucks. That's like, that's a sin. And I think they tried to reinvent the wheel too much on it, where it's like, just do the cartoon people can remember. Just yeah. do that. Yeah, just do that. So, okay, uh, these characters we've all considered to be unsellable, either through our own opinions of them or through the sheer fact they don't sell fucking books they don't have books now From the historical basis what's what do you think is the common thread for these characters uh, i've noticed one of them that you mentioned is magic is a big yes. element in that thing magic is a tough sell overall it really is i think it's why marvel's so afraid of implementing it in their uh cinematic universe and why dr strange is more rooted in like a kind of a pseudo magic more thor science-based thing um I I think two characters that either represent or are tied too closely to an era in time, like Jonah Hex and like the Blackhawks and like uh, Unknown Soldier and all of those guys. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Or that they are they're they're a product of their time, and some characters can like escape that time. You know, like Superman's obviously a product of the '30s, but. Mm -hmm he manages to elevate from that time. He's a timeless character. But, like, for me, the Legion of Superheroes are also a pro byproduct of that, of, like, a time when making up silly-ass characters and having them bounce around and do bullshit is a thing. But I yeah. don't think it's applicable to today. Or, or in order to make them applicable, you'd have to, you'd have to severely and fundamentally alter who they are. And then you get like the Martian Manhunter and Firestorm problem, where it's like, well, these characters are too powerful. How do we how do we write for these? Yeah, I think it, it, there's a, there's also a redundancy factory where it's like we have somebody like that. We have there's someone out there who can do everything you can do, but better. Right, and we guarantee this amount of units sold with his name on it versus yours. It's true. So a any good Firestorm or any good Martian Manhunter story ends up becoming like a Superman story. Yeah. Well, uh, so there you go, guys. What other books did we forget? What what should you? Uh, what books deserve to be better sellers, but just just straight up aren't? I mean, who needs a second that? kick at the can? That's right. That's right. Who? Yeah. Who among this this pantheon of unsellable characters deserves? Or should we all just put them on different? T just put them on their own team and call them the unsellables and just leave it at that. You see, I I'm amazed that's not a thing. I was pushing for so long for characters I love that didn't get the spotlight. Talent. Remember when they were pushing talent? Yeah, I didn't like that idea, but you know, yes, I do remember when they were pushing talent. I really liked Calvin Rose as a character. That was young James Tynan cutting his teeth. I love the fact that he was raised as an assassin but had an aversion to killing. I love that he was an escape artist. But again, you're like, oh, DC escape artist. Don't we already have Mr. Miracle? Yes, we do. <laughs> He point. runs into that problem. Luke Fox Batwing, who he's now kind of come back to prominence as part of Detective Comics. But yeah. Even then, he's not the character I fell in love with in his book. In his solo book, he was basically Spider-Man in a Batman costume in the DC Universe. He was a young kid with problems, but who was a good kid and all this other stuff. Yeah. So that's definitely one. I would I would put them all on a team. Oh, together. yeah. Batwing can't sell a book. <laughs> no. 
No, Batwing can't sell a book, and they've tried. They tried two different Batwings, and he couldn't sell a book. Yeah. But there you go, guys. So thanks a lot for checking us out. And of course, speaking of checking us out, if you are on the West Coast and in the Washington State area, come on down to the Emerald City Comic Con this weekend. You're going to be able to check out me and Joel. And of Not course, this weekend. No, 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 this weekend. When this episode is airing on this weekend. Oh, okay. Shit. We're, we're banking shows, people. I'm not used to this. Yeah. So uh, check us out this weekend. You'll be able to catch me and Joel and uh, Rob and Benny and Caitlin, I think, is going to be there. I don't remember. Is Caitlin going to be there? Uh, yeah. Okay. So everybody from the weekly poll, myself, Tiffany, Joel, Rob, Benny, Caitlin, everybody's going to be there. Uh, we're going to be at the special booth in the podcasting arena. So it'll go down there uh, and check us out, of course, on Saturday at 2 p.m. on the podcasting stage to uh, check out the live weekly poll panel, which, of course, will be filmed and will be up on the weekly poll channel and, of course, here on Comic Pop. And, uh, of course, as always, we'll see you guys next week with another episode of the Elseworlds Exchange. I'm Sal. I'm Joel. And check us out, of course, in the doobly-doo below. So long, everybody. Bye-bye.